So uh, we're back in our sermon series on the attributes of God, and it's important uh, for us to know the attributes of God, um, especially if we want to exalt Him, right? Uh, His attributes lead us to exalting and honoring and glorifying God. You know, there's so many things that change in life, and um, uh, but God is is the one thing that is consistent, right? Uh, yesterday, we were at Kids Castle, Central Park in Doylestown, and we were running to different um, exercise stations. They have this big loop. And so we get to one of the final exercise stations over there. It's this balance beam. And so we're doing the balance beam. I do the balance beam, and I sit down on the wood berm uh, that's over there. Zach does the balance beam, and he jumps down, and he kicks the mulch a couple uh, feet from me. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at him, and I get this excruciating pain in my leg. And I turn over, and I'm swarmed by this whole nest of hornets. And then I get stung in the armpit, and the one hornet was stuck in my sock and stung me a couple times. And I was like, ah! So I jump up, and I run away. I'm like, run, right? So in a blink of an eye... I changed, right? My demeanor changed, my position. I was proud that I finished this balance beam thing. We were jogging, and then I'm running away screaming like a a, a little child, right? And then for the rest of the day, I wanted to be stoic and not complain and whine that my foot hurt, right? And so, uh, you know, so there's things within us that change, but God is unchanging, um, and he is the thing that we could truly worship, right? and honor and glorify, right? And and I tell my kids, I said, you know, don't try to emulate me, try to emulate Christ, right? And oftentimes, in our Christian walks, we get mad at God because of the deficiencies in people, right? The failings of people, the changing when they don't honor and glorify God, and when they don't reflect the attributes of God, right? And so um, I was very fortunate early in my Christian walk to recognize the difference between Christian actions and attitudes and behaviors and Jesus Christ, right, and God. And so it's important for us to know who God is, and that's why we're in this series, right? In this series, it's 14 different attributes of God that we're going through, and we went through these already. This morning, we're going to focus on the eminence and transcendence of God, right? Quick refresher, God is eternal, right? Isaiah 40, 28 says, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable, right? The everlasting God. And it matters to us, right? It's because we don't have to be enslaved by the past, right? God was there. And we don't have to fear the future because God was there. God is eternal, right? When we look at the earth, everything um, was created, And then if we go back and we say, well, what created the earth? And then what created the universe, right? We can see creation. We can see children being born. But everything has to come from something, right, which is the eternal God. God is good, right? Romans 8, 28. And we know that in in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, right? God works them for the good, right? He is the ultimate source of goodness, right? And his goodness provides us great security and comfort because we know the Lord is good. So even in the most difficult times, we can praise him and worship him. You know, a horrendous thing happened. Um, I think it was just yesterday. I found out about it this morning. A friend of ours, her name is Julia. Um, She she used to go to the church that we went to. She had a six-month-old baby that just passed away from sepsis, her first child, right? In the midst right? They had a, a, a baby. Um, actually, I, I think it was born premature six months. So I think the baby was only a couple months old and it passed away, right? This was her first child and, it, and they had the baby. They're holding their newborn baby and now it's no longer, right? And all of us here, or most of us here, any of us who have lived a significant amount of time has experienced things like this, right? Or at, least, at the very least know somebody who has gone through these things, right? And so there is brokenness, and there are horrible things here on this earth. So the goodness of God, recognizing that he is good, and he could work all things together for those that love him, is a tremendous comfort, right? 
And, and there's story after story. Over the next several uh, weeks and months, I'm going to be sharing different stories about people who in tragedy and difficulty have trusted in God, followed God, and um, ultimately have experienced the deliverance of God either here on earth or at the end, right? God is holy, right? Another thing that gives us great comfort. He's morally pure and completely incorruptible. You know, his holiness sets him apart from all of creation, right? All of creation, right? And his holiness is ultimately why he had to die on the cross for our sins. Because when we sin, when we rebel against God, we are separated from him. He is completely holy. Nothing unholy can go into his presence. That's why we need to be washed by the blood of Christ. We need to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior so that we can be reconciled with God. God is all present, right? He's all present. Knowing that God is present, whether it's the good times, the celebration times, or even in the midst of the loss of a child, right? We know God is present, so we can have great comfort in that, right? If, we, if you have made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, he's never going to leave you or forsake you, right? He's never going to leave you or forsake you. And even if you haven't, right, forsake means that um, he pulled away. He did something that he, he, he wasn't supposed to do, right? And even for people who haven't made Christ as their Lord and Savior, he doesn't forsake them. He is consistent, right? People have, have, have chosen not to be in relationship with God. He is consistent. He tells you what to do. He, he's giving you the opportunity, the presence, right, to be in relationship with him. So God is not forsaking anyone. And ultimately, the Christian, right, is not condemned, right? The Christian is not condemned and so the, the context of not being forsaken. So no matter how hard things get, no matter how alone you feel, you can trust and, and know that God is there, right? He is there and he is with you. God is all-knowing, right? It says, John, 1 John 3, 18 and 20, dear, John, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth, and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything, right? God knows everything. He knows what's happened to you. He knows your deepest, darkest secret that you don't want to tell anyone, and yet he's still available for you. He's still there, right, desiring for you to come to him, right? God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful right? He can handle any situation, right? And God can do what he promises. He has the power to do what he promises. Mark 10, 27 says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Amen. And God is sovereign, right? He's in complete control. It's a huge um, important theological thing, an attribute of God. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, oh, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you, right? God is in charge, right? He is in control. He is sovereign. And God is unchanging, right? He is dependable and trustworthy. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. James 1:17. every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father, of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows, right? Here on earth, so often it seems like shifting shadows. Things change so rapidly, right? But God is consistent, right? One minute I'm sitting there, right, feeling good. Next minute I'm getting stung by some wasps, right? And with wasps, it's unfortunate because at least with a bee, you know they're dead, right? You have a little bit of e equality there. You sting me, you're dead. With the wasp, they're still there, right? So things, um, but God is unchanging. Things on earth change. So today we're going to talk about the transcendence and imminence of God. I like this quote from John Frame uh, from the Gospel Coalition. Uh, I believe he's also a uh, professor at RTS, a seminary in Florida. Actually, they have a several different locations. But he says, divine transcendence and eminence 
are the related Christian doctrines that while God is exalted in his royal dignity and exercises both control and authority in his creation, he is by virtue of this control and authority very present to his creation, especially his people, in a personal and intimate way, his eminence, right? So God is the creator of all things, right? He is outside of time and space, right? God is not confined to the earth. He is not confined to the universe. He's transcendent of these things, right? But at the very same time, he's present and he's personal, right? Like when I talk about these things, when I think about these attributes of God, I get goosebumps, right? This is the thing that we can worship and trust in, right? The only thing, right? So his eminence and his transcendence is an amazing thing, right? And then in scripture, we see it. Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite, right? We see God's transcendence and his eminence in this scripture, right? He's in the high and holy place, but still with the lowly and the contrite, right? And that's why a lot of times as Christians or people who believe in God and we're doing the right things, we're not contrite, right? We walk around feeling justified, like we're great and excellent and other people are messed up and they have these problems and whatever. God desires a contrite heart. We all need the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how clean we look on Sundays or how great we act with our family or other people, right? We are all deficient and need Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now, there's some people who will say the fact that, an, that, that Christians claim that transcendence and eminence are attributes of God are contradictory. So therefore, all of Christianity is contradictory, right? People will say that. How can you be transcendent outside of, but also how can you be inside and, 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 and interactive with everything, right? And it, it, if you think about it, you might, you might say, hey, they have a point. But look, we see it in nature. We see it in sponges in water, Right? Water is in every part of the sponge, right? It is eminent. It is within all of the sponge. But at the same time, it is outside of the sponge, right? So I thought this was a great analogy of transcendence and eminence here on earth that we, we can view, right? These things happen, right? We see transcendence and eminence here in nature, right? Not in all things, right? We, you know, within ourselves, we are confined to our bodies, but also it, it does occur, right? So I thought the analogy of a sponge in water is a great analogy of transcendence and eminence, being in and through every part, water, but also outside of, all right? So I wanted to share that analogy as well. Let's focus in on God is transcendent. Webster's, some of their definitions for transcendent is exceeding usual limits, being beyond comprehension, Transcending the universe or material existence, right? Outside of, right? All wonderful definitions for God. Bob Coughlin from Desiring God, another ministry, said, Transcendent means God is above, completely other than and independent of his creation. God is infinite in all aspects of his being and never changes. Only he has no source. No beginning, no end. God needs nothing, depends on nothing, and owes nothing. He is holy, 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 perfect in every way. Simply put, God is God and we are not, right? Transcendent, different, set apart, outside of, right? Psalm 108.5 says, Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth. Right? This is a, a satellite picture of the earth, right? And just the, the, the uh, you know, I see this and think about the majesty of God, right? The transcendence of God. How he, as big as our universe is, right? He exceeds that, right? Let's look at some scriptures. Psalm 57, 5. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Psalm 97, 9. 
For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods, right? Just like the song we sung. Ecclesiastes 5, 2. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, right? God is transcendent of where we are, right? He is above and greater than, right? As we think about the Lord, we, we, we can think, you know, too often people go on the extremes, right? They go on the extremes of thinking that God is outside of and not in personal relationship with us or that he is just like us and like a friend, right? But God is both end, right? Transcendent and imminent. Isaiah 40, 22, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in, right? The Lord God is above all things. Psalm 8, 1 says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Psalm 113, 4 and 5 says, The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high? And then Isaiah 66, first part of verse 1, says, This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool, right? I want to share a lot of verses, you know, I see a lot of them from the Psalms about who God is, right? And a lot of the Psalms are, are songs and poetry uh, to, to, um, of worship of the Lord, right? Of who God is and trusting in the Lord. So why does this matter, right? Why does God's transcendent matter? Matters. It means that God is unlike any other being we know, right? He's unlike any other thing we know. Since God is above all of creation, he has no trouble controlling it or handling it, right? He is above all. And then Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts, then your thoughts. You know, too often we talked about, um, we saw God with the contrite spirit, right? God is there for those with a contrite spirit. So often we get proud and we think that we know the way, right? We even, as we get to know Scripture better and we walk with God uh, better, a lot of times people love to speak for God. They'll say something to somebody and say, God said this, or God told me to tell you this, right? right? And a lot of times they'll say, this is exactly what this means in the Bible, right? And then we have all these divisions between churches and Christians and all types of things, and people, people end up being divided or attacking others over secondary or tertiary issues, right? With God, right? We need to trust God. In him, he is transcendent of all things. We need to trust in his ways. We need to trust and obey the clear things in Scripture, right? There's this new thing, right? And, and, and new, I don't know when, older people here could probably give a better history, of so often now, young people are getting engaged and then living together before they get married, right? And they're doing all types of things. Um, you know, well, that has been going on since the beginning of time, doing things that you shouldn't do out of the context of marriage. But, right, people are doing things because they're saying this is the way, right? And, and it's okay uh, because it makes sense to me, right? This is the modern day thought on X, Y, or Z, right? And so people are doing these things instead of trusting in God, who is above all, right? If God give us an, gives us a clear instruction on what to do, we need to trust in him and not do our own thing, right? That, like constantly, there's changing thoughts. Uh, uh, I think it was last week I, I gave a message and, and talked about some of the scientific theories. You know, all of these things, or the vast majority of them, are, are, are recent history, right? They're recent history. People are going to come up 
with new things all the time, right? When I was um, growing up and my dad wanted us to be strong, he used to have us drink raw eggs, right? He used to have us drink raw eggs. My older sister would say, taste, it feels like boogers sliding down my throat, right? And then he used to put wheat germ inside our oatmeal, right? And then he used to give us like vitamin E and all types of stuff, right? There are all these things for the health habits then. And it was like eat multiple meals a day and do this and that, right? Now it's like, hey, intermittent fasting is a thing. Eat only meat, right? There's people who are going to carnivore diet, right? And only eating meat, no fruits and vegetables, nothing, right? People will constantly come up with different things all the time as it's related to health and wellness and how you should live. So we shouldn't just try, you know, there's nothing wrong with a carnivore diet, right, per se, or making your kids eat raw or drink eggs, right? Drink booger, as <laughs> Tony said, right? except for salmonella, right? We, we, we don't want to do salmonella. But, so things are going to change with people. So we need to trust in the things of God because his ways are above our ways, right? And uh, long story short, related to diet, it's a basic, basic math equation. You eat less calories than you burn, you lose weight. You eat more calories than you burn, you gain weight. You eat the same amount of calories as you burn, you stay the same, right? At the end of the day, right? And we all need vitamins and minerals and things like that. The imminence of God, right? The personal relationship with God. Webster's says, in dwelling, in errant, uh, being within the limits of possible experience or knowledge, right? Being within the limits as well. And then we see especially with Christians, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God becomes so intimate with us, right? He's so imminent that he indwells within us. He changes our wants and desires. That's why we know when people come to Jesus, right, there is transformation, right? And people are different. There are some people who are just rock steady. They never get too high and they never get too low. I'm not super rock steady, but Brittany classifies me as that, right? She's more of the cheerleader type, like, yeah, let's go. I'm more like, yeah, that was nice. That was nice, right? That, that, that was cool. And um, so there's these different things in our personality. So we're going to react different. We're going to feel different when we come to Jesus. But one of the key markers of being a Christian is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and a literal change in our wants and desires, right? Things that we used to do, we used to enjoy, we used to pursue, we no longer pursue because God changed us, right? The transformation from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Bob Coughlin, again, desiring God, he said, God is also imminent. God sustains, is involved with, and is, and is present within his creation. He keeps our bodies from exploding apart, grows the grass that livestock eat, and is personally invested in his world. Despite how small and sinful we are, he is loving, kind, gentle, compassionate, and good. God's imminent. Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24 says, I am, am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Right? Again, we see God's imminence and his transcendence in this scripture. Matthew 1, 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? God is with us. Very beginning in Matthew. Acts 17, 26 and 27. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him, for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us, right? We talked about creation, right? How it's evident in creation, right? A, a, a God, the creator God. But also, right, he did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him 
and find him. Why can they find him? Because he's available, right? He is not far from any of us, right? At any given time. It doesn't matter if you feel him. He is there, right? Seek him. Seek him, right? So they would reach out to him. We talk about this all the time. You know, in difficulty, often we feel separated from God. We don't want to pursue God. We, we, we want to stay within our own feelings and our emotions, our darkness. We want to complain to others, right? We want to do things that are unedifying or, or not helpful for a situation, right? Seek God in any and all circumstances, right? Over and over in Scripture. Genesis 28, 16 says, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Right? This is a part in um, Old Testament where Jacob was being sent from his uh, father Isaac to go find a wife, and he's um, in the process of that. He falls asleep. He has a dream, and God communicates to him in his dream. And he wakes up and said, God, is, the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Right? The Lord is there. Sometimes you don't know it, right? When you're, when you're thinking about doing something bad or evil against God, don't think he's not there, right? You might not feel it, right? You might want to think he's not there, but he's there, right? God is in that place. Luke 17, 20 and 21 says, Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst, right? Talking to the Pharisees. He says, the kingdom of God is in your midst, right? God's presence is there. So why does it matter, right? It matters because God is near, right? It means that God is available to you, and we can know him. We can know him. How do we know God, right? through reading of the scriptures, through prayer, and through fellowship, right? When we share life with each other, we can support each other and lift each other up. We can help each other experience the Lord, right? So it's important that we are Christians, act, right, believe first and foremost, and then act through word and deed, right? Through word and deed. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call on him to all who call on him in truth, right? There's a lot of people with hard hearts, and they'll call on the Lord with a hard heart, not really desiring to see him or be in relationship, right? But God is near to all who call on him in truth. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. You know, as we think about Julia and her husband and their loss of their newborn baby. And you, many people here, know people experiencing difficulty and challenges. Let's, let's be the hands and feet of Jesus and reach out to people in their struggle and difficulty, right? And as we experience those things, let's lean on the Lord. Let's not become isolated, right? And uncommunicative, right? Like, let's, let's come into community and let's communicate with one another, right? At the same time, God is transcendent and imminent. He is above all things, and he is near. He's not far from us. We can know God when we seek him. So praise God, because there is no one like our God. Amen? Right? Who else would die for those that dishonor him? Who else would die for those that disrespect him right? on a regular daily basis? Let me pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for being like no other. As we see your attributes, oh Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us can take them to heart, uh, that they will take root in our hearts and our minds, oh Lord, and that we will trust in you above all else. We will put our faith and our hope in in you and your plan, O oh Lord, your plan from creation to the cross to your return, O oh Lord. Each and every one of us will see you. At the end of our life or the end of this earth, 
we will see you, O oh Lord. And I pray that none of us can think that we were good enough or did well enough that we deserve to be in your presence. So I pray, O oh Lord, that we can be contrite of heart. We can recognize ourselves as the lowly, and we can put our faith and our trust and our hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen.